to talk indeed uh, about beauty, so the expanding beauty regime, which is uh, recent work uh, that I've uh, been doing, so not so recent, but I think you, most of you will know me for some other topics that I've been working on. Um, so it's actually, so I have the original title, but then uh, I'm expanding it a little bit. So it's also, I'm also going to talk about the riddle of female beauty, and those of you who know Yobe's work might recognize this as a reference to one of his uh, articles. So I want to start by saying that um, uh, for me, uh, Job is, so as I, I was his doctoral student, and I think for me, Job also has sort of lives on as what I tend to call a voice in my head, in the sense that whenever I'm writing, I have this sort of Job in my head, sort of commenting on my writing style. And I think one of the things, one of the skills I think that I've learned, and also one of the standards for good writing, is the rather self-defeating uh, skill, I must say, of polishing everything and writing everything down in such a way that it seems so simple that it's almost self-evident. And I think that's a very uh, Houtzblomian skill, where you sort of write and write and write until the point that you think, well, of course, and at the moment, and that's actually a skill which, for instance, in Fire and Civilization, I think is very clear, that it's actually a remarkably thin book. So I went back to it, it's like a remarkably thin book for covering so much. And it's really, I think, the style, and I think this is something that we see everywhere, in, in Job's work that is sort of simplified and simplified until it becomes, well, almost, you, you keep thinking, well, why, why I never else? Of course, this is the case, which, as I said, is a very self-defeating skill. And I'm trying to do something now with my book that I'm working on, which is about the sociology of beauty. And one of the things I am uh, trying to explain there is the notion of an expanding beauty regime. So the... Um, the statement, the claim, that uh, in the past century it has become increasingly important to look good. Uh, and so this has expanded in the sense that it's something that is increasingly important for people of all ages. So not only for young people, for women, but also for men. So it's also including more genders and also in more and more domains of life. So it's actually beauty is becoming much more important as something to, to strive for, to expect from others. So as a regime in the, the, the Houtzblomian sense. So regime, uh, which is a word that starts to, has started to pop up in the work of Elias in scholars, I think since the 1970s, um, is, uh, so I, I'm expanding it a little bit, as you can see. So it's a, I explain it as a durable system of more or less standards for behavior. So the system involves a number of things that you may recall as directly uh, Eliasian. So standards for social control and self-control. But I think it's also important to think about these as standards for evaluation. So what makes a good something, for instance, a good person, uh, and standards for self-worth and self-identity. Uh, and these standards, again, textbook, figurational, embedded in interdependencies, and these interdependencies tend to form relatively durable systems. So the letter two, so numbers two and three, just very quickly, um, actually are an attempt to sort of integrate this sort of uh, Elias understanding where culture is very much about systems of social control and self-control uh, with uh, understandings of culture as they happen in cultural theory right now where the focus is on various forms of meaning. So I'm trying to sort of see how I can balance these two strands in understanding why beauty or appearance is more important today than it was some time ago. So I'll talk about this quickly because when I submitted this abstract, Nico Wiltrink emailed me and said, well, this is just a hundred years. Can't you make this a bit more long term? So Afterwards, I'll offer some speculations on what this would mean, also this analysis of the beauty regime in making it really long-term, and that will take me back to this riddle of female beauty that I talked about before. So this means I'm going to do the analysis of the expanding beauty regime a bit quickly. Well, as you know, if you know me, uh, I have this tendency to sort of do a lot and then talk very fast, so bear with me. But I'll, at, at the end, I'll sort of unpack what sort of bigger questions about beauty um, as a specific regime uh, this might raise that might be of interest also for other sort of more Houtzblomian uh, long-term questions. So think about this of a telescope. So we start with 100 years and then we sort of make it longer and longer and longer. 
as we go along. So this is one of the ways that we can do long-term work, right? We, so we begin with just 100 years. So if we think about beauty standards 100 years ago, uh, then I think something like this uh, might come to mind. So um, this is actually, so this is uh, 1919, uh, so just after World War One. these are the fashions of then. Um, <coughs> So there are some, some things that we do recognize from these images. So for instance, that beauty standards are very strongly gendered and also that they tend to be much more so that female beauty tends to be much more accentuated with all sorts of colors or as uh, male uh, appearance tends to be downplayed, uh, which is known in fashion theory as the great male renunciation. So those of you who have uh, ever worked on uh, court society you read about this, which I think is very likely here, you will know that men at the time actually uh, dressed up and sort of cultivated their beauty and their appearance uh, quite extravagantly. So this is something that interestingly all over Europe in the course of the 18th and 19th century, there was the, the standards for men became increasingly sort of somber uh, and not beautified to the point that today in the English language, if you talk about beauty, uh, people will actually... Um, uh, think that this is a word that is not supposed to be applied to men. So this is actually very, very difficult in comparative research. So in most European language, uh, the word for beauty can be applied to men and women, although it's more directly associated with uh, women everywhere. But in English, also in the interviews that we did, people tend to really sort of um, um, be slightly appalled or confused about the idea that male beauty is a thing. So it's actually, so this is one of the things, but more importantly, many of the things that we think of, if we think of these sort of uh, early 20th century beauty standards, which as you know, changed very quickly after this, are, um, um, our view of this tends to be um, skewed in the sense that this is really about the rich people. So these standards that we tend to think of sort of these nice flowing, flowing beauty dresses. So the beauty regime until the early 20th century was actually for, was for well off, mostly younger women. Uh, so for instance, most people, even in Europe in the early 20th century tend to have no more than three or four sets of clothes. Uh, and all the forms of cosmetics that we tend to think of as very normal right now, including things like toothpastes, uh, actually were quite uncommon in most of Europe. So the beauty regime until the early 20th century was really was something, so the images that we have tend to be about uh, well-off women uh, and mostly younger in the sense that this was the time that it was supposed, you were supposed to be beautiful and after that caring for one's appearance was just for, and it was just important for a specific phase in life, for a specific group and for a specific gender. And this is something that has changed very quickly. If you think about probably your experience right now, you know that it's also for men, it's increasingly important to become beautiful. Uh, also for that many different domains of life, for instance, for work, uh, throughout the life course, beauty is important. So it's becoming an increasingly important uh, resource, a standard, a requirement for being a good person. So I have, uh, in my planning about 10 minutes to tell you why I think this is. So this is a very long chapter that I'm happy to share with you, uh, but I just want to show you the sort of arguments that I make and explain why it has become so much more important to be beautiful. And I think you will recognize the style of reasoning, so I think I can be fast. So one of the things that have happened is uh, an expansion uh, since the beginning of the past century of visual media culture, uh, which has taught us uh, not only uh, that there are many more people than we realize out there who look good and that we can look at, but also has expanded our knowledge of uh, the various ways of appearance, how you can make your appearance better, and it has trained us as audiences. It has trained us, given us knowledge to understand, to look at other people and to judge them as beautiful because of the endless number of images and pictures of people, very often beautiful people that we see every day. Uh, and this comes with a whole series of male and female icons of beauty that become sort of the, the, the standards that set the standards for understanding of how appearance can and should be cultivated. So the standards vary, so they shift over time, but what remains is the fact that there is a class of people that is there to be looked at 
and thus a much larger class of people that is there to look at these people and to evaluate them aesthetically, also suggesting that it's important to look good. Second, so I'm going very fast, I told you, right? The second is the rise of consumer society. I think this is very important, so if you know this, this is one of the most important uh, slogans from consumer society. So from the beginning, the rise of consumer society actually has been very, very much about appearance. So consumer society not only has been about clothing, so garments, which I think has also been, as you know, one of the main drivers of uh, industrial expansion, uh, but also the uh, in the in the invention, so to say, of an endless, endless uh, number of things that you can buy to look better, not only your clothing, but also uh, your body, including such things as shampoo, uh, various sorts of cream, toothpaste. So just think of the number of uh, things you have in your bathroom right now that are supposed to make you look better. And this comes with an ethos, a consumerist ethos that really tells you that appearance is important, that you should invest in it and that you will return it. And this uh, very famous slogan that I'm sure you must have uh, heard in any language in which you have grown up, which is because I'm worth it. So the thing is beautifying yourself is something that omdat je het waard bent in Dutch, but I think there are uh, many versions of it, I think it's the most famous slogan, and I think this is sort of the ethos that comes with consumer society. You are taking care of your appearance, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're young or old, because you're worth it. So this is an ethos that has taught us to care about our uh, appearance and also that it's important to care about this. So it's learned us, it's taught us skills and it also taught us a habitus. So very quickly, so this actually comes with two different styles of beautification. One is real beautification, sort of amending the appearance to make it look beauty. The other, interestingly, really very much links beauty with health. Uh, and I think for Elias here and scholars, I think this is important, the understanding that taking care of your body is something not to do just to uh, look better, but also because it's good for you, because it's healthy and because it's morally right. I think it's a very strong sort of tendency in the contemporary beauty regime. For instance, if we're talking about obesity, this is increasingly seen as both ugly and unhealthy, thus making you a bad person. So the beauty regime also was connected with various moral and um, hygien hygienic regimes that has strengthened it and really rooted it very quickly. So third, now we're going to, I think, more familiar terrain for all of us. Actually, this beauty regime is a process of democratization. Uh, so this uh, startles people, especially people who know the work about beauty, because beauty is, as you know, so much of the theorizing about beauty comes from sort of feminist and gender scholarship, where it's typically seen as a regime that suppresses women, so it's a way to sort of discipline people, but it's also in a very, it's in, a, in a sort of neutral way, this expanding beauty regime is a process of democratization in the sense that a resource that at some points was available only to a specific group is becoming more available to a wider number of people. So the capacity to judge beauty, to evaluate beauty, but also the capacity to beautify yourself, to cultivate your beauty is, an opening up of resources to more people, so to everybody. So it is a process in the sort of neutral term of democratization. I think this is very clear in the sense that there have been two big waves of quickly changing beauty standards. And one of this was the 1920s, which I think we all know as a moment of very quick, important democratization, increasing access of all sorts of group to all sorts of political, economic, and social resources, so the expansion of rights. And this came with the reinvention of beauty standards, uh, which is known from the figure of the flapper. So with female uh, votes, so with female suffrage, came uh, also the expansion of the, the right for women of women to cultivate their own appearance. And we see the same in the 1960s and 70s for larger groups. Uh, so, because this may seem a little counterintuitive, it's really democratization. So what's happened in the course of the 20th century is that people have increasing access to beauty as a resource. 
So this resource is double-edged, is both the capacity to cultivate your beauty taste, to have a more refined, uh, more fine-grained, more differentiated taste in looking at different sorts of beauty, evaluating it, judging it, uh, having standards, and of appearance, the capacity to think of what you look like to improve that, to change everything about this. This actually is the opening up to resources, for better or for worse. It's also led to increasing control for more people over their appearance and their bodies. So if you look at the image of the flappers of the 1920s uh, female style, it's actually, it's, it's really a reflection of more control over your body in the sense that this is a form of fashion uh, that required um, no personnel. So this is the first time that women had actually had beauty styles that allowed them to dress up without having all sorts of people doing their hair and sort of doing things with corsets. So it really is also an opening of a control. And that means that appearance and beauty also have become, importantly, an arena for struggle, for symbolic and political struggle. Um, note that this has losers and provokes backlash. Uh, but I think beauty as an arena for political struggle, and I think one of the big, we now have this, this, but I think very interesting is of course the Black is Beautiful, which indeed is the mobilization of beauty as, as a claim, a political claim for the empowerment of previously uh, disempowered groups. So beauty really also is used as a political resource and em embraced and used in the political arena. It's actually something that we see now also in the new activists, which also have to do with beauty standards for women, but also for uh, transgender, where also beauty has become an arena. So if something becomes more important societally, it also becomes an arena for political struggle. Fourth, after the 19, after in the second half of the 20th century, we see the rise of the service economy, which also has made uh, appearance much more important. So there is a large body of work about this that you may know, starting with the notion of emotional and aesthetic labor. So what happens if more people work with other people trying to sort of sell things, convince them that something is important, where more of work consists of not uh, working on the land or working in a factory, but really working with other people, then appearance becomes much more important again, because this is part of the package that you're selling. And I, so there's some examples, so there is a very good body of theory about this, about the thing called aesthetic labor, where actually your appearance is very much part of how you sell yourself. Uh, there also have been a number of uh, highly publicized issues where people have been selected on the basis of their appearance for specific jobs. So air hostess is one very important example, but also there have been uh, a lot, it's been a lot of attention for Abercrombie and Fitch, which is a global uh, clothing store that has been, uh, has received a lot of criticism for selecting people on the basis of beauty. So this is actually a fourth reason why it's really very quickly due to the shift in um, economic structure of especially Western societies where appearance has become much more important. And five, in the past 20 years, of course, we've seen a digital media culture where right now everybody, in a sense, has a, a virtual double, uh, an online uh, version of themselves carefully curated uh, that is just a little more beautiful than others. So this digital media culture has... Uh, uh, taught people even stronger to be able to judge it, beauty, to look at appearance, to have a critical sort of eye on appearance, but also it has taught people that it's really important to look good. And one of the places where we see this, of course, is that it now that we see actually appearance, so first selection on the basis of images, we see uh, expanding to a lot of domains that previously used, used to be more or less uh, outside of this, specifically for men, so if you look at the selection of mates, partners, this increasingly happens via apps like Tinder for the those of you who know this. So this is what Tinder looks like. So you swipe right and left if you like someone or not. Uh, so Tinder is how many people these days find their partners or things very much like this. So this means that first selection is not based in social networks, but increasingly in selection on the basis of images. Uh, and also... For those of you who work in academia, I think you may have noticed that academic CVs increasingly have images. Also, if people apply for things like, you know, 
professor jobs or postdocs, where I think we would all agree that maybe appearance is not the most important qualification for becoming a professor, but it's now very often one of the first things that people see when they're making the selection for professors in the sense that it's on top of most CVs, so it looks like this. So there too, appearance is actually becoming much more central uh, even though people say they don't care, but of course they see it because we are very, very attuned to looking at appearance. So this is a skill that is really um, very strongly impressed on you from very young age. So appearance is also becoming increasingly important in domains that we used to think of as not important for, for appearance, such as work. And also it happens throughout the life course because people usually don't have the same partner for most of their life. So people go into the dating market again and again in various apps. So what do we see expanding? So we see beauty tastes expanding. So there's more knowledge and there is more standards for appearance of self and others for more people in more domains. So what's expanding is beauty work. So there are more opportunities to cultivate one's beauty, and there's also more pressure to do this. Uh, so what's expanding is also access and control uh, to beauty for more people, domains in which beauty matters, and also the importance of beauty and appearance to self and self-worth. So your idea about how good a person you are is for more people, especially for younger people, increasingly anchored in how you look, and this tends to go on throughout the life. So this is what I call the expanding beauty regime. Uh, so this is a reinforcing, a self-reinforcing process of social control and self-control that economists have described as a rat race. Uh, and I think I try, to, I try to explain this very often by, by talking about teeth. Uh, so I think uh, when I was when I was uh, uh, a child in the 1970s, so I have, as you can see, I have sort of irregular teeth. So this is something that happens for people of middle age. Uh, but but now I think most people. So now most people, younger people, have had braces when they were a child. So they have straight teeth. So what happens? So at some point, at one point, and this is very much like Hauptbaum's law of the three, three stages, right? So there used to be a lot of people with messy teeth and few people with really nice teeth. Uh, and then it was an advantage for the people with very nice teeth. But now everybody under 30 in the Netherlands, not in the UK, by the way, in the Netherlands has very, very nice teeth. And then it doesn't really work anymore as a way to, to distinguish yourself and look better. So then the, the levels get up. So what used to be beautiful now is normal, and what used to be normal now is ugly. And this goes on and on and on. So this is the mechanism that economists describe as a red race, but it's, of course, also the mechanism that we know um, from both Weber and Elias, where we see exactly the same, where standards of social control and self-control, they used to be ways to distinguish yourself because you were the only one who has the skill, but then everybody is trying to catch up. And what happens is for everybody, the standard raises, and this produces a new cultural system or a regime. So this was the story I originally wanted to tell you. And now I have five more minutes, I hope, to explain uh, what happens if we take a longer perspective, as per the request of Nico Wiltudink, because this was just 100 years, of course. So this goes on and on. So I'm not looking at the future. I'm looking back. So what happens if we zoom out from this period of just, just a century? Um, so if we look at beauty regimes in a very long perspective, sorry for the S here, uh, some questions and speculations. So I'm not... This is... So the question I think that Job would ask, okay, so we've done this, so how is beauty important at all, and to whom, and how have these beauty regimes developed in human history? So we do three steps. So the first, I think, that, that uh, emerges from this is the matter of regimes as uh, downplaying or cultivating several bodily skills. So we have, as human beings, we have bodies that come with sort of, and minds and biologies that come with sort of capacities uh, and limitations. And I think if you look over 
human history in the longer term, we see that some of these skills at some periods of times have been downplayed and all others have been cultivated. So the capacity to appreciate beauty for human beings is definitely there. It's very strong, it's very deep, it's clearly embedded. But the way that it, how important it becomes and how it plays out really varies greatly according to society. So I can show this with some examples. So one, of course, is the capacity to fight. So that's another a uh, very strong human skill and capacity that we share with other animals. Uh, but of course, this is a skill that now is not trained as much. So I, for instance, I think most of us would not be able to fight. I honestly wouldn't. I know I probably have, but, but I think for most people today, even if you happen to have this talent for fighting, you may not even be aware of it because it's just a skill that is not uh, called upon that much. Uh, but the opposite happens for beautifying yourself. So this also is a capacity that I would say most human beings have, but it's something that now is called upon very often. I'm lo looking at this, so this is the makeup cup, which is a contest for, make for makeup. So it's a makeup contest on Dutch TV. So this is actually something that is trained and cultivated very much. So this is something, uh, and another example, even more Goudsblomian, of course, is the training of uh, dealing with fire versus the training of beautifying yourself, also something that's, which is both an individual skill and a skill that is shared in society. My son is seven years old, and I think a couple of weeks ago, this was the first time that he saw someone light a match. He had never seen it. It's just, it just doesn't happen anymore if you don't have candles. So this is a skill that, that can be differentially trained or not. So, and also the second one, which is the mental theme, which is also, if we zoom out more, is I'll skip because I'm assuming you know this, the corpulent to um, thin ideals, which is a slightly longer term. I want to end with a final, uh, the riddle of female beauty, uh, which some of you may recognize is referring to a paper, one of the favorite papers, I would say, that Job wrote at some point. And this really is a riddle. Uh, so um, I want to just give it to you as a riddle and not give you the answer. So I'm not sure if how many of you know, uh, but these are the king and queen respectively of the Netherlands and of Belgium. Uh, and if we, if we see this, obviously there's something that you may notice, which is that the women are looking much more colorful than the men, which I think is a very common pattern in uh, contemporary societies around the world. This is a very intriguing contrast with how we see this in the animal world, where this is exactly the opposite. And I think this is something that, also having read a lot of evolutionary work, is something that really is not very well explained. So how did it happen that in human, in human beings it's so different from other animals in the way that uh, we think about women as beautiful and men as not? So this is indeed a riddle, the riddle of, not the, not the riddle of male power, but the riddle of female beauty. And this is also, uh, by the way, if I may, a paper that I, I worked with for Job on this book, The Regime von der Tijd, and it's one of the... Um, so I don't really have a good answer for this. So I have some answers, but I think it's actually... Uh, and this is also one of the reasons why I like this paper by Job so much is that he also said we don't really understand. So we can come up with a lot of explanations, but in fact, the fact that men have been able to to um, hold on and grab power in so many societies around the world, in a sense, is a riddle. It doesn't really make sense. And he ends with what I would call a sociologist creed. I paraphrase here a little bit. He says, if we want to explain these gendered differences that we see across human societies, so it may be physical capacity in the role of male power, he says, strength, but I think in beauty is physical capacity, knowledge and organizations, but the greatest of this is organization. So this is a true sociologist creed. If we understand how it is, it's about the way that people have built durable organizations that make some resources available to some and not to others. Thank you very much.